Hello, everybody. My name is Mehdi Mejawi, founder of APIs Conferences and the moderator of this amazing panel uh, and webinar discussion that we will have today on API productization. Uh, we are waiting just one minute for all persons to uh, connect to uh, the, the webinar, right, and to the live broadcast. And so we'll start in one minute from now. So stay connected, have a, go take a drink, uh, right? And so we'll be back in one minute. Thank you. Hello, everybody. We will start in 30 seconds. Uh, we're waiting for everybody to connect, all participants to connect to the live broadcast. And uh, uh, we will start this webinar on API prioritization with our two uh, guest panelists. So 30 seconds from now. Waiting for this last 10 seconds, please know that uh, you have a, a Q&A section where you can ask questions all, uh, dur during the whole presentation. Uh, and so amongst you and one and I will be uh, glad to answer these questions um, during the presentation if that makes sense, because it, first, uh, 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 it talks about one slide or one, uh, one specific topic, or at the end we will have uh, 10 minutes for all questions, answering all the questions. So uh, let's start. Uh, let's start. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome everybody to this um, executive API webinar. Uh, we are glad to have uh, two subject matter experts on the API uh, products and API productization, which are Amancio Buza and Nuwan Diaz. And today, this webinar will be uh, about product productizing APIs to create sellable digital assets and generate revenues. Right. And the the main idea is really the why and how to think your APIs as a product, right? So that's, uh, that's really what we will try to, uh, to talk about today. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by uh, three uh, partners for, for, the, for this one. So the first one is API Days Conferences, right? You can check on apidays.io, all events of the main series of API uh, industry events worldwide, uh, right? Held in uh, nine countries every year. So if a lot of you probably have attended already, if not, you can check, uh, you can check there. And actually, uh, our guest panelists have been speaker at the PIDS conferences in the past. It's also brought to you by uh, the API community-driven media platform, uh, epicene.io, where a lot of contributors and a lot of thought leaders of the space write articles and push them on the, on, on, on the website. So if you want fresh news related to the API industry and to be inspired or inspire others in your organization, yeah, you can go on epicene.io. And uh, so the third partner is WSO2, uh, one of the leader of the API um, management uh, industry. Uh, and no one at the end uh, may tell you a little bit more about uh, who they are and, and what they do. So uh, let's go into uh, the content, right? So what is API productization? Uh, and we will try to answer today in this webinar these few questions, right? Uh, what is an API as a product, right? Uh, what does that mean? What are the expected benefits? of API as a product for my company, right, or my organization, right? Uh, what are the differences between API as a product and product APIs? So that's a question we often have a lot. Uh, should all APIs, especially internal APIs, should be designed as a product, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a compelling question too. Uh, we will also abort uh, what the, the role of, of an API product manager, right? And how internally uh, I can nurture an internal uh, mindset for any API project management um, capacities in my company. And then we'll also talk about monetization of API as a product, externally, but also internally, if, if, if we have the time. Right? 
uh, and also depending on your questions. And our two subject matter experts today that we're really glad to have are Amancio Buza. He's a strategic advisor, many company, principal consultant, uh, and also author of the book API Product Management. So it really, we cannot have someone more specialized on the topic today. And we also, we also have Nguyen Diaz, uh, which is a senior director on API architecture at WSO2. Uh, and the uh, co-author of the book, uh, so he has uh, the business and technical uh, capabilities, and as um, uh, as also product manager, he will be able to tell us a little bit what our APIs as a product. So uh, I will, I can't let you wait a little bit more to have this content you've you've uh, registered for and waited for. So I'm on you. Uh, I propose that you share your screen and uh, you start by presenting what you had, uh, what you have in mind for us today. All right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for, for having me. I'm quite excited to do this webinar uh, with you and also with Nuvan. So it's really cool. So let's get started. <clears throat> and uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, one exciting image. So I guess what you see here now is just some black spotted. And when I saw it the first time, I also just saw black spots. And probably this is really similar to um, all the topics and terms that we come around, like what is an API product, API building block, headless products, and so on and so forth. And at the moment, it might seem that there are just some black spots and you don't really see, or we don't really see, okay, how are they really connected and so on. But uh, in an instant, I will show you another picture and then come back to this picture. And then you really will start to see and I hope that this webinar really helps you and um, to understand APIs and to make API products or make them see. So I show you the picture now and you see uh, uh, a dancing pair, a man with, uh, with a woman dancing and if I we go back and I'm sure you will start to see. So before it was just some black spots but now you see the two dancing persons. So <clears throat> that's a promise that you will understand what API as a product are and all those terms and also how to approach API products. How can you start to build them? It's not just um, creating a, an API specification, designing APIs and publish on a, on a uh, platform. And what will your organization become when you do API products? So that's uh, quite some uh, uh, fascinating topics. So let's deep dive into the first one. So let's understand API as a product first. And uh, to understand API products, you need to first to understand uh, products. And let me tell you a, a small story. <clears throat> so in this uh, um, COVID time and with the lockdown, I started to uh, uh, investigate, okay, how can I uh, improve my home office setup? And then I use Google search to uh, look for, okay, what other people do for their home office, uh, what webcam they are they using, uh, um, what lightning, what microphones and so on. And I use Google to search for reviews. And from those reviews, I got some tips about the lights. So I went to AliExpress uh, searching for light and ordering it. So just improve that, let's say for, for video conferencing, the lightning of this. And what you see here is really two interesting things. So on the left side, it's Google search. Um, I think you have never paid for one search, so it's for free, but it's a product because uh, how we define an API product, it's really an API product is, so, or a product is something that creates value for a group of people. So that's the, the people that are using Google search for finding things and the organization itself. So Google really benefits from this Google search because they gather data, they can make uh, preference profiles, what you are looking for to uh, uh, get or monetize their Google ads. So they get money with Google ads, but use Google search to gather data and insights. So that provides value to us and to Google. So this is a product. On the other hand, uh, um, you have AliExpress, of course, uh, the, the value there is really to buy the stuff, the products. And uh, the own the way to buy products, it's kind of a journey. You have to select the products and add it to the cart and check out. And this checkout uh, feature 
it's not a product by itself. It's uh, uh, useful because we need to check out to buy things, but it's just an interaction and the features really uh, a product capability that people can interact with. So for instance, you don't go to Amazon or AliExpress just to experience the checkout, right? You are going there to those platforms to buy things. <clears throat> then you have components uh, or building blocks. These are really uh, uh, the databases where your order gets stored and also the processes, order fulfillment process, for instance, payment process. And um, that's just the uh, uh, components. So we have products, they provide value to a group of users and the organizations. Features, uh, they provide interaction with the product but don't provide value by themselves. And then building blocks or components. Uh, and here it comes really this uh, kind of a, a perspective um, into place because those components, for instance, the payment process here for AliExpress is just a, um, a component, a building block, but uh, uh, for, or for, for us end users, because we don't uh, get value for, for, for it. But there are, for instance, companies that uh, are specialized and provide an API product for payment processing, for instance, Stripe. So they took a component, a feature, and turned it into API product by just altering who the customer actually is, who actually the user group is who uh, gains value. And now they are selling it for on all e-commerce platform uh, uh, providers. So uh, in short, API product is uh, the definition, a digital product offered as a service, service which provides value to a group of people and the organization. And that's uh, the important thing also how API economy comes into play. So API economy is about the positive impact of API on monetary and non-monetary goals of an organization. So an API, for instance, Google search, uh, it's a product. It has an indirect uh, <clears throat> positive impact on the, uh, uh, on the business value that, uh, creates, uh, that Google creates, but that uh, is not directly monetizable. And on the other hand, AliExpress, for instance, they sell products and get the transaction fee out of it. So that's a direct monetization. And here we've got the overview of all the, uh, the terms. So I already spoke about API product. <clears throat> and then there's the API as a building block. So these are the architectural components. You can, for instance, uh, uh, imagine uh, um, some APIs uh, that you can use to connect to database, some kind of perform CRUD operations to retrieve data, to store data, these kind of things or an OAuth API to get the access token to uh, call securely an API. And there's also a the difference, difference between an API product and the product API. <clears throat> so product API, it's a, it's a feature of a product. So itself doesn't provide the value. So it's a product behind the API, which, uh, provides, uh, um, which provides the value. And there are headless products. For instance, Stripe or also uh, more and more e-commerce platforms, which become headless commerce products. You can see that it's um, a little bit uh, uh, a point of view or perspective. And um, you can see it as an API product because the consumer uh, of those uh, products, they only see the API. They don't interact with the product behind. So for, for their, from their perspective, it's just a, a black box. Uh, accessible via API. So you can also name it uh, an API product. And the term API as a product, it's more about the mindset uh, that you create value for a group of people and your organization. And of course, some practices to build API products. And uh, also to make maybe some uh, concrete examples. So what we, for instance, uh, uh, we did from our experience, so imagine we had, uh, um, we had some clients <coughs> then they had a problem. So uh, they wanted to onboard uh, um, uh, new customers on their platform and uh, all of them, they had to verify the identity of those people. So that was the initial problem. Uh, so they verified their uh, phone numbers via SMS, verified their email address via sending an email with a verification link and even send a letter home to their home address 
uh, just to uh, verify if they are really living there. And you can imagine with every verification, the conversion rate dropped uh, uh, immensely and to the point that they only had 10% conversion rate from the people who started the onboarding process <coughs> to, the, um, to uh, finally completing it. And um, what we found out uh, or uh, thought, okay, well, we as a company, we have a large custom database, but instead of just providing them access, we provide them a value. So they want to identify, verify the identity and we provide this kind of service. So that's the value that we can provide to them and we can uh, monetize it uh, for each request uh, to create a value for the organization. So that was an API product. And uh, thinking about API products, so there's, uh, um, I mean, you can create APIs to uh, improve uh, and optimize business processes, to connect uh, things, to reuse, to reduce uh, um, uh, the cost of new projects. And, but something is actually missing because if you have a product, you want continuously provide value to customers, you need really to understand, okay, who are actually the customers? Uh, how do you measure uh, the value that you provide to these customers. Also internally, how do you align those products and evolve these kind of products, new features, new capabilities within your organization, such that it is still aligned to the strategy of your, um, of your organization. And also I uh, think about the business model, how can your organization uh, uh, create value out of the API product? So that's really the task of an API product manager, which is key. So uh, don't do API product as a project because a project will finish and nobody will monitor it and take care of it, evolve it. Uh, you need a continuous process for that. So that uh, sums up uh, um, the definitions of API uh, products. So how do you approach API products? And we have already seen um, what actually matters. <clears throat> So for instance, left, you have the customer and uh, uh, in the middle you have uh, our Super Mario and in the middle you have uh, this nice flower. So this flower, it's just an API and it doesn't provide actually value. What you actually sell is what the customer becomes after consuming the flower. So in the example of uh, before with, uh, with, uh, with companies who wanted to onboard uh, um, customers, so just providing them a, an API to uh, get access to a customer database doesn't make sense. So that's actually the asset that we have, but it doesn't make sense for them. But selling them the capability of verifying the identity of those customers, that's the value that you can sell. And the API, in the end, it's a, an interface to this value proposition what we call also VPI or value proposition interface. So it's the way how you interact and uh, consume or make consumable the value proposition to the customers or the consumers. <clears throat> so what you need to understand is uh, first, um, the, who is actually the customer? What jobs does he want to get done? So in the case of Super Mario, um, he wants to save the princess, but uh, he, um, uh, faces a lot of enemies and what we provide to him. In this example is a, a flower to shoot fireball and um, destroy his enemies to easier um, save his uh, princess. So we know, need to know his pains and also what assets do we have uh, available as an organization? What can we reuse? And how do we translate these assets to a value proposition that is uh, relieving the pains of the customer? So there's a really nice uh, uh, method from uh, uh, Mark Osterwalder who uh, created the business model canvas. It's called the value proposition canvas. And it's quite, uh, um, uh, has a simple structure. On the right side, you have the custom profile. We need to understand the customer. Who is the customer? What does he want to achieve? And also the pains. And on the left side, you have uh, uh, your data sources, your business processes, your systems capabilities and applications. And your job now is to uh, formulate pain relievers <coughs> um, or the value proposition to relieve uh, the customer's pains directly. And what is the API? The API is in the end this interface 
to the value proposition. And that's what you um, sell to the customer. So you can see um, that um, it's a uh, custom centric and this custom centricity leads to an outside in approach. And that's really the key to start from the customer and uh, uh, work backwards an API first approach, define the APIs that way compared to just let's uh, start from the application, um, um, design or uh, specify a generic API that doesn't really um, target a specific pain of a, a specific customer. So for the example with, uh, uh, with the identity verification, so we had companies who uh, had websites who wanted to onboard um, customers and their pains was really a poor conversion rate because they wanted to uh, verify a lot of information. So on our side, we had a, a huge customer database that we could leverage. We had also customers API to access this uh, data easily from, from the customer relationship management application. And what we uh, formulated was uh, quite simply, the value proposition quite simple. We said, okay, we provide a identity verification service to uh, uh, easily verify the identity and with that increase the conversion rate of onboarding customers. And from that uh, value proposition, we identified just one API, just one API feature. It's uh, uh, if you uh, think in REST APIs, it's just slash identity verification that you can create, providing just some information about uh, customers or the information um, that you uh, get from the onboarding form. And we provide back uh, an answer uh, if it's verified or not. Simple as that. So API as a product um, really represents the outside in mindset that you have to apply in order to build an API product. <clears throat> And having uh, or based on the value proposition canvas or the VPI canvas, you can go further to a, to a lean canvas or business model canvas, or in this uh, uh, case, an API product canvas. Um, you have already entered uh, uh, or know the customer, his, uh, what he wants to achieve on the left side, uh, the problem number two. So what are his pains uh, that he wants to get solved? And uh, in the middle, the solution, that's uh, based on what assets do you have and what value preposition you provide and also what the uh, APIs you provide uh, to the customer. And in the middle, the value proposition, of course, the most relevant thing that you actually provide. And then you can just work um, on the other uh, canvas. For instance, what are your business goals with uh, this API product? Do you want to uh, create a revenue? Do you want to uh, um, increase your core business? or just in the case of Google search, you use those data to, uh, as an input for, for Google ads to have kind of an indirect uh, monetization. Then you think about revenue model, how are the cost structure, because when you have an API product, of course, you have also to take care about the 24 seven, first level support, all these kind of things. And also key metrics, so uh, not just how many calls you get from the API, but also, um, what or how well you deliver on your value proposition. And then also understand, okay, what's the ecosystem partners to really um, uh, provide customers a better, uh, a better service. So what will your organization uh, become in the end? Um, <clears throat> it was really funny. Um, so uh, some years ago I was invited uh, from Daimler and uh, uh, they showed me a really cool thing, it was uh, so they developed the car API. So you could control your uh, uh, Daimler car or Mercedes uh, via an API. And they were proud about their trunk API. And the first thing I thought, okay, how interesting or how, how much value do I have if I can just open a trunk via an API? So instead of just uh, pressing a button, I have to uh, pick my phone, go to the app and press their button to open my trunk. It doesn't make sense. But uh, um, they told me a story, a really nice uh, business case and it blew my mind. So imagine um, you are in the office, uh, sitting there and you got an SMS uh, on a smartphone telling you, hey, you just missed the delivery because uh, the delivery uh, um, 
provider who brings the package or uh, something that you had just uh, uh, ordered from AliExpress uh, uh, was at your home, but there was nobody who opened the door. So uh, you get the message that you just missed it and you say, okay, well, I missed it. Tomorrow is a next date, but I will anyway work at the office, so I miss it again. So uh, how can we solve this problem? Um, so um, what she can provide actually is the, to, the, to the delivery provider is a car information, the location, where is my car, and use the trunk as a, as a post box. So what she provides to the delivery is the location of the car and the limited access to the trunk. And um, the delivery provider, he knows the location of the car, uh, gets the box, goes to the car, requests a one-time access from the, from the owner, and the owner approves it. So the trunk uh, opens and the delivery um, provider can put the box into your trunk. Um, you get notified that the trunk was successfully delivered uh, to your car. And uh, when you go back uh, after uh, a working day, you just open a drawer and you got the package. So this is a really nice uh, example of a, a collaboration between two companies. So um, a car or a trunk API itself doesn't make sense, but uh, you have to um, think about who the customer actually is. So it's not your... Uh, so it's not the, the owner of the car, so it's DHL who gets value of a trunk API because they can have an additional option to deliver um, the package to, uh, to people. <clears throat> so API products, so they are offered as a service and of course uh, um, consumable via APIs. And uh, if it's a, a good API product, it will uh, be part of a, of a custom exosystems, just uh, like the example from Daimler and the DHL with the trunk APIs. And uh, it will really complete um, this uh, uh, or create value to the customer um, as a whole, such that it really creates a nice package. And if you have really a great uh, product, um, you will be able to use those products uh, in different industries and for different uh, use cases and customer journeys to really create uh, and solve different jobs to get done and grow worldwide in a uh, connected world. And that's the digital ecosystem. So that means uh, um, from my point of view, it's really um, API as a product, it delivers really on the original promise of APIs. They create really business value. And also it may change what your organization is actually doing. So it's not only about the integration, optimizing business processes, but also starting to think, okay, how can we provide value to, to our customers, potentially to new uh, types of customers, to new industries, which also provide value to other organizations so that we gain a uh, uh, value uh, for doing uh, API products. And this is what digital transformation actually is. Um, I was this year, or in the uh, beginning of this year, I, I met Min Gang. He's a, a, a magician, entrepreneur, and keynote speaker from Adelaide, Australia. And uh, he learned me, or taught me one thing. So if you cannot solve a problem, you need to change the perspective. And that really um, applies perfectly to APIs. So APIs are not just for integration, point-to-point uh, -point integration, or not just reusability within a company, but they can really create value if you just start from the customer point of view. And uh, I hope that uh, um, this part helped you to see the picture and I'm sure that you uh, don't see any more um, just black spots. So you see the two persons dancing and I hope I could also help you to understand better API uh, as a product. Thank you. So uh, now a new one will take over and uh, show his great things. Yeah, thank you, Monsieur, for his great presentation. Uh, no one will start, but I, uh, I, now I can only see the two people dancing. <laughs> I cannot see <laughs> anything else. So that was a great, great picture. So we have some questions, but I think uh, knowing Nuan's presentation, uh, they will be better answered after, right? So let's, uh, let's go to Nuan's content and let's have this discussion all together uh, in 20 minutes. Okay. 
thanks um, Nidhi and, and thanks uh, Amansio for, for those great uh, inspiring thoughts uh, and words and for teaching us uh, about APIs and products. So let me walk you through a section where we talk about, um, about building API products, like how uh, you, you can build API products, what are the thought processes behind it, what are the things that you need to think about. And once you build a product, what are the things that you need to consider to now make this a sellable thing? Uh, that's one of the most important success factors for any product, not, not just API products. And finally, um, we hope to talk about uh, monetization. So there are different types of monetization uh, that we will be talking about. Um, yeah, so my session is uh, split into these three parts and uh, hope you enjoy. So let's dive in. So I guess uh, this was uh, presented to you before as well. So I, I thought I'd, I'd, present, I'd start off by defining what a product is. So if you go and ask Google what a product is, this is what it will tell you. It will tell you that it's an article or substance that is manufactured or refined for scale. So what does that mean, uh, refined for scale, sale? Sorry. So what does refined for sale mean? Refined for sale implies that you have a particular audience and this audience, uh, or you can call it a customer, is the most important factor in, in thinking about uh, API products because it, it's all about the audience. It's all about the customer, who you are giving it to and what kind of value addition uh, this gives them. So uh, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to an API product, this audience or customer that you are really thinking about is a developer. So if the developer is successful in, in building a, a nice valuable experience for your end customers, then you make your API product very successful. So before we walk into, uh, get into the stages of, you know, talking about how to build an API product, let's take a quick look at what, what it takes to build a regular consumer product today. So uh, if you look at the different stages of a product, uh, life cycle, you have the manufacturing. This is where you build the different parts uh, of your products, of your product. And, uh, and then comes the assembly line. So you assemble these parts together to create a, a product. And then comes the packaging. So which is one of the most important things. Uh, so if you, uh, and packaging is basically why, you know, unboxing has become a thing today because uh, the, the experience that you give to the customer in your product is uh, hugely has a huge impact, right? So packaging also has to do a, a lot about branding, about uh, uh, creating the first user experience and so on. So packaging plays a, plays a critical role uh, in terms of the success of your products and, and delivery. So you figure out what are the ways and channels you have to deliver your product to your uh, consumers. And finally, all of this has to be automated. So a successful product uh, process needs to be something that is repeatable if it is to be a viable business opportunity. So automation as well is a key factor uh, in making this whole thing uh, a success. So that's kind of what uh, it looks like to build a, a regular consumer product that uh, you and I are aware of and used to. Now, if you look at the products of the 21st century, the type of products that we're dealing with today, all of them have a digital experience. So even if you go to buy a car, yes, you do walk to the showroom to, to, to see the, to try out the car, but really before you do that, you really browse the web, you look at what, what its features are, you look at how it looks like. So everything that you consume today basically has a digital experience. So what that basically means is that APIs are essentially the actual products of the 21st century. So if anything, if there's something that doesn't have a digital experience, it's almost as if it doesn't uh, exist, right? So <clears throat> let me start off by making the statement that APIs are indeed the products of the 21st century. So let, let's now look at what it takes to build an API product. So if you try to compare it with the analogy of a, of a typical product, these are basically what it, uh, the, the stages and what it looks like. So. Uh, imagine you want to build a retail, uh, a retail site, a retail uh, uh, online retail store like like AliExpress, like Amansio was talking about, right? So, uh, if you're talking about a retail experience, just imagine the type of functions that you will have in there. So you will have you will have a function that you know uh, browse allows you to browse your product catalog. So it will allow you to browse your catalog. It will allow you to search your catalog. It will also allow you to you know edit your catalog, add items to your catalog, and so on. Right, and then it'll have a function that makes you 
uh, place orders, right? That makes you place orders, that makes you search for orders, that makes you modify your orders and so on. So the manufacturing uh, phase of an API product starts with manufacturing these little pieces. So if your end objective is to build a retail store, you first have to build these little pieces and they are done using our traditional software development life cycles. And then you get into the stage of assembling these little uh, bits and pieces into APIs. So imagine you have uh, this, uh, the, the, the products API. So the products API could have functions, like I mentioned before, like such as for browsing, searching, um, uh, modifying and so on. So these functions may also be uh, developed as indiv individual pieces. So if you're familiar with the microservices um, patterns and so on, you'll know that these different pieces could be or should be developed as independent systems. So uh, the assembly is basically bringing these systems together, integrating with the new functions you develop, integrating these with the already existing functions in your system, such as uh, like imagine the order uh, API, right? The audio API needs to be integrated with uh, payments, like something like PayPal, uh, your payment gateway and all of that. So you need to build these integrations. So that's basically the assembly line uh, of your API. So you assemble these pieces into creating API. And then comes one of the most important aspects of an API product, which is the packaging. So it's actually this packaging that uh, creates, uh, creates this product. So if you uh, go back to the example that I was uh, talking about, right? So if we look at this um, product catalog API, so this product catalog API uh, has two audiences. So it, when, when it comes to the packaging is when you think about, right, uh, the, the audiences, right? So uh, now one of the audiences of this product catalog is of course your buyers, the, the people who are consuming your products. And another audience of this, um, uh, of this product API is the people who are updating your product catalog, like the people who manage your inventory. So here you figure out that you have two audiences now for the uh, product API. And also if you are giving this API to someone to build a retail store, a mobile application, you have to package a couple of APIs together so that they can build a, a, a seamless and a nice experience. So for example, you need to package the, the some parts of the uh, product API, uh, uh, catalog API, some parts of your uh, order processing API, uh, and so on, right? So you package these uh, different parts of the APIs or complete APIs as themselves into these API products based on the audience that you want to sell this to. Uh, and also, again, uh, packaging also involves creating user manuals, that is uh, documentation and you associate business plans, if it makes sense, uh, to these packages, and you uh, associate categories so that it becomes easy for people to find um, and explore these packages. So these are some of the things that are involved in the packaging phase uh, of API. And when you're done with your packaging, you figure out the delivery mechanism uh, of your APIs. So uh, as Amonzi also mentioned, APIs are some things that are unlike a physical product, they, they are delivered as a service almost always. So <clears throat> uh, you have to figure out how are you going to deliver this product to your audience, to your customers. There are different API platforms, we call them marketplaces and so on. And we figure out uh, what scale we want to deliver these to, right? Uh, <clears throat> we want to figure out the, the, the usage and so on and uh, figure out our delivery based on the demand. And finally, you need to think about automating all of these. So just like a factory, all of these processes need to be automated. Of, of course, there are some creatives in here that involved, uh, which are basically, uh, which are done by humans, but really uh, creating this entire process and taking it forward and repeating this requires a whole lot of automation, uh, CICD uh, and things like that uh, to make this a viable uh, business product. So that's basically uh, the, 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 the equivalent uh, of, um, of physical products. So if you think of a factory, API management systems and, and integration systems, a combination of these are the equivalent of an API uh, of a factory uh, of a physical product. So uh, they, they have the tools and the processes that you need in order to create this workflow. Uh, so that's basically how you compare a factory with uh, with an API management and integration system. Now, since since we're done through like figuring out how, what it takes to create a product, let's see what it takes now 
sell these products or make them sellable uh, artifacts. So the first and foremost important thing is about making them discoverable. So unless your product is discoverable, there's not going to be any customer base. So it has to be easy to find. Um, so you need capabilities. So you first of all need something called what we call a user portal or a developer portal, which is where um, you have these APIs for browsing and searching and so on. And these are some capabilities that are required, like you need to be able to tag these by various uh, names, categorize them according, accordingly, you need search facilities and so on. So what you see on your right is, um, is a developer portal of the uh, government of New Zealand, uh, where they have a set of APIs uh, built on our platform. And, and you can see that they are categorized by, by department, uh, by ministry. So this is basically one, one example of uh, how you make your APIs discoverable and you need to uh, think of ways uh, that suit you uh, <clears throat> to make your APIs as discoverable as possible. The second important thing about making them sellable artifacts is, uh, is about making them easy to use. So anything that's not um, intuitive, that's not user friendly, uh, is it going to end up being a uh, bad, bad product. So you got, you, there needs to be serious thought uh, going into the, the usability and user friendliness uh, of your API products. So when it comes to APIs, these are all about interfaces. So as if your interface is, you know, directly comprehensible, like the moment you look at it, you can understand it. You don't need documentation. If, if that's kind of like the ultimate interface we are talking about. So if you can get to that, great. So you need to make your interfaces as intuitive as possible and have systems so that developers or your customers can take a trial run on your APIs, like a sandbox and so on. And think about documentation. So you need to have two types of documentation here. One documentation that talks dollars and, and another documentation that talks about the test technical aspects. So the reason you need both is again for selling. You need to talk about efficiency and so on. Uh, when it comes to business documentation. So uh, what you see on your right here is uh, like a Wells Fargo uh, developer portal, which uh, it's again has been built on our platform and it won uh, this um, uh, Monarch award about, about one and a half to two years back. And, and this quote is uh, something from the press release uh, saying that it makes it fast and easy uh, to customers. So that's basically uh, what we want to eventually get to. Um, <laughs> And one of the most important things in, in the digital world today is uh, uh, security and privacy, right? So if, if you, when you see a physical product, if you feel like it's not safe to use, you're not going to use it. But when it comes to digital products, uh, it's tricky because you can't assess the safety uh, of this by looking at it. So when it comes to digital products, uh, safety or, or security is won through trust. So how do you, uh, win the trust of your consumers? How do you uh, make them trust that this is a safe thing? And, and, and the path to that is to go with standard protocols and well-known channels. So as long as you pro uh, promote or use standard protocols uh, and trusted channels, that's an easy access way um, to get, win the trust of your consumers, of your customers. And that's basically uh, one of the very important things about making your API safe and secure. Now, when it comes to security, a key aspect is, is user convenience. So usually what happens is the more secure you make your systems, the less convenient it gets for your users. So you need, really need to think about systems that not only support the typical API management capabilities, but also have a very strong access, access control and federation capabilities to build the right uh, 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 bridge between these two. So things like, you know, uh, uh, biometric based authentication and so on are, are systems that are, are protocols that make your system not just more secure, but it also makes it uh, much more uh, convenient as well, convenient to use. And finally, there's something that you need to understand when it comes to security that there is no ultimate level of security uh, in the world when it comes to digital products. So if someone is trying to sell you something saying this is 100% secure in the digital world, well, don't believe them, it's a false. It cannot be achieved um, today. So as long as the, 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 the intruder or the uh, hacker has the right amount of resources, the right amount of uh, access, uh, systems can be penetrated. So, <clears throat> so 
it, you definitely need to set up the right protocols, the authentication schemes, the authorizations and, and all of that into your systems. But what you essentially have to do as well is uh, uh, to monitor the system in terms of access patterns, uh, use machine learning techniques and artificial intelligence to look at the, 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 the to, to learn the patterns and understand uh, what are the things that don't look right. So you shouldn't just rely on the authentication and authorization. Uh, you definitely need to have them, but you also need to keep looking at your system and see whether something is going wrong. So if you can uh, uh, find out an intruder within one hour, that is way, way more better than finding it out, finding it out one month later. The, the impact landscape uh, differs massively. So another important thing when it comes to the success of API products is scale. So if you look at the IT landscape during the last um, five decades or so, you see how it has been moving uh, in, this, in this picture. So what we are getting to is, is an era of where we will have millions or billions of programmable endpoints, which we call APIs. But, uh, but the 80-20 rule comes into play here. So we will of course end up in a situation where most organizations will have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of APIs, but it's going to be like 20% of them that are going to be catering to 80% of your traffic and, and the other way around as well. So you really need to think about efficiency, cost of operation, and so on. So what you need to be building are systems that can both scale up and scale down uh, on demand uh, and which are efficient. So uh, with minimum resource wastage and so on. So one of the things that uh, I experienced working with one of our customers here in Sri Lanka is that they had built, uh, uh, this was a taxi booking system similar to Uber. And the highest demand they had in their system was uh, during Friday evenings and Saturday evenings. Uh, and unfortunately, they, the, the demand on their system got so high during these peak times that it crashed their system. So <clears throat> the, the, the ironic situation here was that like, the, the moment when you're, you are able to make the most amount of revenue in your business, you're actually making zero. Uh, so, the, so that's kind of like a very uh, ironic and, and sad situation. So what they did was uh, until they figured out how to scale up their system, uh, they used an API gateway to do some throttling on their traffic and then they basically uh, could operate at their maximum capacity. And we saw this happening during the last few weeks with this, with when everything went into lockdown, we saw many digital uh, businesses uh, crashing down because of the sudden uh, demand and uh, because of the inability to scale. So this is also a very important factor to consider. And finally, uh, on, on the success of APIs, uh, you need to think about how you can improve uh, your processes, uh, improve your API product. So <clears throat> the, the, the funny thing about humans is that it doesn't matter how good a product you give to me today, I'll find it boring in one year time. So that's the nature of humans. We always want to move forward. So uh, just because you get a very successful product uh, deployed today, don't think that, that that's it. It'll be gone in one year unless you're careful enough uh, to keep monitoring it and, and to make improvements to this. So Qantas, as we know, is, is the national uh, airline carrier of Australia. So they uh, adopted an API first approach uh, using our platform. And one of the key things that they did in this process was uh, they set up uh, uh, feedback mechanisms, both uh, for passengers, both the during flight, uh, during the journey, as well as um, after, uh, after they completed the journey and made sure that these customers get a better experience every time uh, they come in. So they were able to actually reduce their operation and not only reduce their OPEX costs by, by 50% uh, through this approach, uh, but they also were able to increase their API traffic to 500 by 500%. So that's basically the success of, of the API products. And, and the main reason for that success was that they built a continuous uh, improvement and iteration cycle. So <clears throat> let's talk about monetization and, and uh, revenues uh, of this. Um, now, so, so APIs are, are always uh, monetized. So the, the only difference with APIs is that they are either monetized implicitly or explicitly. So Amancio showed a great example when he started about Google's uh, search API and uh, how we perceive it to be a free service, but really it's not a free service. We, we are actually paying for it indirectly. Uh, so that's basically implicit monetization. So if you look at uh, 
uh, uh, what do you call uh, systems like you know Twilio and Stripe. So their systems are uh, in their cases it's the APIs are the business itself. So uh, so that's basically one example of how uh, the the monetization is built in, like it already runs on. And then there's the other model of uh, explicit monetization where uh, um, you API serve as a mechanism of earning additional revenue to the organization. So idea is the picture that you see on the right is, is an initiative or a project uh, by Dialog, which is uh, one of the largest uh, telco operators in Sri Lanka. So what they had was they had these APIs, the SMS API, the UCSD APIs and a bunch of other APIs uh, that they used internally. So what they decided to do was they, they publicized all of these APIs uh, through a developer portal uh, built, built on our platform and they encouraged developers to come in and create applications too. They said, hey, get creative and uh, create cool apps uh, using these APIs. And they, they initiated a revenue share model. So whoever builds an application using these APIs and when people use these applications, uh, these users consume these SMS APIs and you know, UCSD APIs and so on uh, for, for this application to function. And as a result, what happens is Dialog gets an additional revenue uh, that they wouldn't have got uh, if not for these applications. And, they, and then they share this revenue uh, with the people who develop these applications. So for an SMS, uh, if you get a certain amount, uh, if Dialog gets a certain amount, they, they share 70% of it with the application uh, developer and then they kept 30% uh, of it for themselves. So really, you can get really creative with, with the APIs that you have in your organization today. And there, then there are various monetization models, like so one-time pay is like a one-time subscription fee. fee. Uh, when you subscribe to the API, pay as you go is kind of like the example that I just talked about. Subscription base could be things like monthly or yearly based subscriptions and so on. And when talking about monetization models, delivery models, uh, API delivery models uh, matter a lot and I'll talk about that uh, in this slide. So <clears throat> most of us are, are quite familiar and, and seen API delivery models that are direct from producer to consumer. So the, what that means is, so there's a, a producer who's giving an API and it's directly consumed by some kind of a consumer. But what we are also seeing is, in, is, is an increase, interesting pattern where this concept of a middleman is coming into API products as well. So what that means is if you uh, think about consumer products, we are all familiar with this concept of a middleman. So there's a producer who produces the products and then there's a reseller, a partner, someone who takes this product and sells it to some other people. So we are seeing the same pattern emerging in um, uh, API products as well. So uh, we work with a bunch of customers who are who have built a federated marketplaces where they use these marketplaces uh, to host APIs of different providers, some uh, being their partners uh, and, and so on. So this is an interesting uh, era we are um, coming into. The same concept of, of this, uh, the, the, the middleman in regular products are coming in here. And it, this is a whole uh, different uh, topic. So there we, we identified some of these patterns and uh, practices that some of our customers are using. And uh, if, you, if you visit this link, uh, you'll find a talk uh, by, by our CTO, Paul uh, Fremantle, uh, done at API Days Paris last year. So he talks in detail about these patterns and, and, and the kind of benefits that organizations have uh, reaped by building these kinds of federated experiences. So you may have heard about so, so Amon mentioned this to me while we were having a chat uh, one of the, uh, the the other days regarding this, and he said this, this looks cool because we, we are familiar with B two B APIs and, and B two C APIs, but really this is now about uh, saying this is B two B to C. So this is an interesting pattern that we are uh, we are seeing uh, emerging as well, uh, and helps uh, in monetizing uh, of your APIs as well. So that concludes uh, my session, and I hope. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you found it uh, interesting and uh, useful. So if we have questions, I guess uh, we can take them now. Yeah, thank you, Nuan. And uh, also, Amancio, you can turn on your video for the question, question time. Uh, so we have a few questions that you already answered in the chat a little bit, but maybe we can address them uh, a little bit back. So the first one was from Anshu Mishra about how does API fit to citizen integration? So I understand in that question, like, 
you know, when uh, for civic tech, open data, you know, when government and public sector wants to do application for citizens, and sometimes there are already open data files, right, around, uh, what APIs and APIs as a product bring to the table for uh, the civic tech ecosystem? When there are already the data available, you know, in open data format, like files and stuff like that. APIs over files. Yeah, you want to answer? You want to take it? Sorry. Uh, you want to answer? You want to answer that one? You you uh, answered a little bit uh, already, but yeah, this is about the citizen integrator. You're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so I actually covered uh, a little bit of it during my session. So this is about I think uh, integrating uh, system. So. I talked about how this uh, order API needs to be integrated with, you know, systems like PayPal, systems like, you know, a payment gateways in order to build this API. So, so how do you do? How do you do this? So you need, uh, you need integration systems to build this, right? So, uh, and of course, when it comes to citizen integration, the the main thing is uh, low code uh, integration. So, for example, instead of writing some code directly to uh, integrate with PayPal. You have a PayPal connector which you can drag, drag and drop into your API flow, and it automatically connects to PayPal. So, so yes, I think citizen integration can be a major part of building API products. Okay, uh, so we had we had a lot of questions, but again, um, if we if we go back on the on the the first one, so the scope of an API product. So, new one, you say that based on the audience, right? The scope. Yes, exactly. So, so I think the scope of the product needs to be decided on uh, who this product is intended to. So I talked about uh, this product API, product catalog API, where certain parts of it were being uh, positioned to the users uh, who are browsing your products. And then another part of this product catalog API is being used by the people who manage your inventory. So really, so based on your audience, you decide uh, what the scope of your product is. So I'm answering your answer to a question about, yeah. I can please, maybe please also add on, on that. So uh, I completely agree. So the audience is really important. Um, so, but um, for the scope, you have to really to, um, to formulate some sort of API product vision, which includes the audience and also what do you want to actually solve, which problem of the audience or the custom do you want to solve and how. And this formulates the scope of your API product and how also how or where it will um, develop next. Yeah. Yeah, well, I take the question also by the time we have, do we have example of an API as a product for the financial environment? Can we say that Stripe or Avian, you know, are uh, in that case, or Xignite, you know, for financial data asset management, right? We can, so that's three examples, Stripe, ADN for payments, processing, and uh, maybe Xignite for, um, uh, let's say, asset management and portfolio management uh, there. So just a few, few examples. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, a question for, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, the, the API specifications coming in from the open banking space are, I think, a good example for that. So yeah, we, have, we have various regulations for Europe, UK, Australia, and so on, and all these have API product specs, so th so they too are an example of the financial sector. Okay, uh, one question about uh, we had a lot of question right now, but one quick question about WSO2. Some people are already using uh, uh, WSO2, but on top they they want they want to use WSO2 API manager for authenticating and limiting customers. Is it possible? Question from Arun Mohan. Yes, that's possible. Yes, that's a standard function. Yeah, uh, also one question about, uh, from Bennett Redin, with the notion of smart endpoint, great APIs, how do we, how though do we mediate from API A to API B? That is, how do we manage to transform between get new employees information to set up employee payroll, right? So how we transition from the system to a new one when you design API as a product? And that will be our last question today. Not easy. So how yeah, do so you rebuild facade, right? Yep. Yeah, so I think this is where, where the importance of integration comes in. So uh, building an API product uh, almost always requires some level of integration. So uh, whether it's low code integration or whether it's code integration is an implementation detail, but 
uh, building an API for requires these kinds of implementation and various uh, API platforms uh, support this in different ways. So in the case of WSO2, we have a complete integration uh, layer that supports this. Uh, but if you look at some um, other vendors, they do support uh, different kinds of policies where they have like DSLs for writing some integration code. So different uh, people uh, take different approaches to this, uh, but fundamentally what you really need is uh, not just an API proxy, but also some the ability to write some integration code uh, that, that builds this entire flow into it. So last two questions uh, for the last minute we have. <laughs> How to make API compatible to cyber restriction, uh, but to make it global, because they use APIs as gateway as to every specific requirement they have demand, demand uh, a kind of unique setup like authentication, encryption, et cetera, but how you can make it global, right? How you can make global a specific gateway, uh, let's say configuration. You know, because of cyber restriction in many countries. Is it easy to have a, maybe a full featured gateway security requirement, but let's say uh, adapt it in different areas? Yeah, so, so I think, think you can do that. Yes, yeah, so, so I'm not sure I 100% understand the question, but uh, fundamentally, so the Swagger Open API uh, is used as the API spec, and uh, different API gateways have their own uh, mechanisms of defining uh, routes. So in the case of WSO2, we expect, uh, we accept the, the Swagger itself as, as an AP uh, artifact to the gateway and, and can figure out the routes by looking at that. Uh, but if you think of something like Nginx, for example, so they have their own way of uh, defining the routes. Uh, you look at Envoy proxy, they have their own way of defining the routes. So what matters is how, how capable they are of taking this Swagger file and converting it into their own uh, routing specification. So as long as you can achieve that, which is like technically possible, uh, I guess you can uh, achieve uh, what you're looking for. Like mix uh, contract-driven yeah. development. Yeah, no, please go. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, what would be really interesting to have kind of an ABEC, so attribute-based access control for API management, uh, where you can really, okay, from where is the, the API call actually coming, from which country, and then you can just uh, dynamically take the, the set of uh, um, security policies and adopt just on, or, or wrap around uh, the, the core API. Yeah, last question. So the citizen integration actually has been explained by someone is uh, making API usable by non-developers, right? Low code or, you know, like these drag and drop platforms, right? like IFTTT or Zapier, you know, or many, or many others. So uh, maybe last question, maybe for you, this one, Amoncio. Uh, do you need sometimes to productize your API as much as making them usable by non-developers or low-code platforms? When is next Can time? you repeat the question? <laughs> so at one, for, me, for what use case you may, uh, you may um, uh, productize your APIs in a way that they're even consumable by non-developers, you know, to be like, uh, you know, platforms like Zapier, EFTTT, IFTTT and stuff like that. So people can drag and drop and use it, you know, even there are non-developers. So it's a high level of productization there, right? Yep. So do you see any use case? Uh, I see a lot of use case in IoT, for example, when they want people to be able to have their object to connect with others, mm -hmm. right? And so they want people to be able to do it, right, on an app, right, where actually the API was a really, really tiny UI, we just connect or not, right? Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe that answered the question. So I, I think that's, uh, oh. uh, it makes sense. So not only focus on this, right? So enable uh, citizens programmers to, uh, uh, to connect those APIs, because <clears throat> the good thing about that is really, um, they know what they actually need. And if the APIs are discoverable, so they can really find the right pieces and put them together, to get the jobs done. So uh, you don't have, as an API provider, uh, don't understand or, or create uh, an ecosystem with other partners to so provide such kind of product. So people are out there uh, um, uh, using your APIs and making uh, this kind of job. Um, the disadvantage is uh, you can't monetize them very well. You don't understand how much value you actually create and also in what context you are cre uh, using, also what is the customer journey? So you lose that. So um, I suggest 
rather to understand the customer journey, what they actually want to get done and create value with that. But I don't think it, uh, there might be cool, really cool business models um, to still uh, gain also value for the, for the organization, of course. Yeah, thank you, Amancio. Thank you, Nuan. I go. I went a little bit over uh, by five minutes because we had a lot of questions. So I take the entire responsibility of this. It's because we have a great community that that wants to know more about the topic. So if you have, uh, um, uh, so for everybody in the in the webinar, thank you for being there. There is a. If you check the box, I want to receive the slides and the videos. You will receive them automatically uh, by email afterwards. Uh, and for all, you will receive a link for the recorded session to be able to have the slides and the video uh, and check them on epic.io. Uh, we were really glad to have you, uh, Amancio and, and Nuan, and also we really want to thank the Brioso2 to, to be the supporting partner of that, of that uh, uh, webinar. Uh, I hope you will have a good day where you are, right, Amancio and, and Nuan? Thank you. Yeah, and looking, and looking forward, uh, looking forward meeting you all, uh, attendees and, 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 and panelists in uh, one of our next uh, EPIDES conference. Enjoy your day where you are in the world. And uh, yes, uh, see you at next webinar. Bye. Thank, thank you. Yeah, Bye. See you soon. Bye.